and uh, all of those of, yes, yes, you hear me good now, good, thank you. Uh, we welcome all of you this morning to our worship service, and we celebrate our countries. Anybody remember what, how many years? 245, thank you. By the way, the Army chaplaincy also celebrate their anniversary 245 as well. Call me if I'll tell you that. All right. So welcome, everybody. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> oh, Lord God Almighty, we are blessed to come into your presence. We are blessed to be in this service where your people, where you promised us that where two or three are gathered in your name, that you would be in the midst. Lord, we welcome your spirit this morning. We welcome your presence. We ask you to forgive us of our sins and where we have fallen short. Open our hearts to receive you in words and songs and music and in fellowship and scripture and the reading of the scriptures. Open our hearts to receive you in these many facet ways that our souls may be touched, that our souls may be blessed. Lord, we remember our country. We pray and thank you for this great America country. We know that we have many challenges like any country, but we are grateful for the foundation of the gospel. We are grateful for those men and women of all races who have built this country and made it what it is today. Lord, we ask that you continue to give us the grace to do this, continue building. But we built it on faith. We built it on a foundation, a foundation that built upon your word. Lord, we have strayed away from that, and it's caused much problem, the dissension in our country. But Lord, we look forward and we pray in Jesus' name that you continue to guide us. We pray for our men and women in harm's ways, those that are be leaving Afghanistan, those who will be deployed back to their families. We pray for these as they unite and as this uh, transition, which will cause uh, a family problem as they uh, mingle together again. We pray, Lord, that all the agencies at Fort Bragg and around the country will be there to assist our men and women as they integrate back into America and to their home and their families. We pray for our first responders. We pray for those that are sick that I miss. We think of Shirley Trogdon, Lord, as she's one to gone serve. We think of uh, uh, um, Sam Gore, and we think of Ms. Sherry Estes, who's not feeling well today. We pray for her. We pray for LaVon and Doug Wass as uh, news came that LaVon has a, a patriotic cancer. We pray for her that, Lord, your blessings, your comfort, and your healing on her in the name of Christ. Lord, we pray for our church family. We pray for Mike Spells, who is also in his house written right now, the Criners. We lift them up to you. And Father, we thank you for this great congregation that we have here in, in community of Hope Mills. We ask you to bless. Help us to be a beacon of light, a beacon of hope to, the, to our community, to our families and friends. Lord, we thank you. And we pray for Dave. We lift our friend up to you, his son-in-law, who is a uh, at critical point of death now, we pray for the Fur family. We lift them up to you in the name of Christ, that you would be with that family, that you would comfort them and give them guidance. And Lord, if you see fit in your own way, that you may raise this man up again for your honor and glory. Father, we pray this prayer and we give you thanks in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand and sing with us.
getting situated. Um, <laughs> I didn't know if they wanted me to come up or what. I was trying to catch myself here for a moment. I'm picking up these little cues. It's your time. All right. God bless y'all for coming today. Good to see you. We are so honored that each one of you are here today. It means a lot to us. Uh, we pray and give God thanks for you and for your dedication and your service. Um, <clears throat> like for you to turn with me in the book of Second uh, Corinthians, the twelfth chapter. Second Corinthians, the twelfth chapter. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this passage of scripture. It's one of my favorites. I don't believe I ever preached on this text before, so you have to bear with me, okay? You know, the thing about preaching and finding that you preach, sometimes you ask yourself, am I qualified to preach? Am I qualified to, to talk about the things here in Scripture? Because everything in scriptures applies to me, not just to you. And especially our text this morning, am I qualified to talk about something here that perhaps I've never experienced? Am I qualified to do that? And you'll get to the point where I'm talking about in a few, few moments. Read with me to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting with verse Two. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heavens. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. <clears throat> and I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows was caught up into paradise. He heard inexpressible things that man is not permitted to tell. And I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weakness, weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surprisingly, surpassingly great revelations that was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I played, pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my prayer, for my power is made perfect in weakness, therefore I will boast all the more gladly my weakness, weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. 
That is why, for Christ's sakes, I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Think of those words. Think of the power of what Paul is saying here. Weakness becoming your strength. To shed light on this particular passage, Paul, in 2 Corinthians, he had written to the church, the church that he founded. He was very proud of. People were growing. They had a lot of problems in Corinth, all kinds of problems, church problems. But nevertheless, it was his baby. And even though he could not be there all the time, he stayed constantly. He was in constant contact with them, reminding them of the Lord and their faith in their growth and their commitment. However, during the span of that absence, there arose false prophets who began to chide the people away from the gospel and away from Paul. They were saying to the folks at the church that Paul was not a good speaker. Not only was he not a good speaker, he was least likely the guy that you would want sharing gospel with you or leading you or directing. Paul was a weak guy, but he had a very powerful ministry. He was weak, but he had a very powerful ministry. And this is what we're going to talk about this morning being weak in God's sufficient grace. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Paul uh, was, was defending his territory because these false prophets had come in the church and they want to take over. Paul says, not without a fight. Paul was in love with his people. He was in love with the people that he had brought to Christ. He saw them grow. He baptized them. He was there in hard times. But here the church was facing a challenge. If you read about the city of Corinth, idolatry, pagan worship, anything you want to name, it was going on in the church. I'm, I'm, when I say anything you want to talk about, it was happening in Corinth. People get surprised today when we here are things that go on in the church. It's been happening for years. It's been happening for years. Paul wanted to remind these false teachers of his validation. In chapter 11, he talks about how many times that he has been persecuted for the gospel. Eight times in a span of Scripture, he talks about da danger, excuse me, danger, eight times that he faced for the gospel. Paul was building up his credibility. If anybody who has a right to preach the gospel, he said, I am the guy. I've done more than any of you guys. You are talking, but I've been there. I've been on the front line. I've seen the war of what it takes in the spiritual battle that I endured because of the gospel. Sometimes we ask ourselves, you know, am I qualified to do this? Am I qualified to preach? Am I qualified to teach? I have so many things in my life that I don't see how I can be qualified to do it. I still have hang-ups. I have problems. But I want to tell you this morning, God's grace is sufficient for you. It's not about you. This world that we live in is just not about you. It's not about me. We are part of God's plan. And to live a whole life, whether it be short-lived short or whether it be for however, and to miss out on God's plan for your life, to miss out on that opportunity. What Paul talks about here, he talks about, he talks about in this passage of Scripture, he talks about the, uh, 
uh, experience. Experience of um, God's sufficient grace in spiritual encounter. He, he talks about that. He speaks about it as though uh, he reminded his critics because they, they pride themselves on showmanship. You know, if, if our, our country, our world prides itself on showmanship. Who can preach the best? Who can uh, sing the best? We love showmanship. Paul said, I had an experience that surpasses everything. He said, I had an experience that surpasses everything that you can imagine. Look what he says. I know a man in Christ Jesus who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven. The third heaven. Do you know where the third heaven is? The third heaven is where God resides. It's where the angels it's where Jesus Christ himself sit on the right hand of the Father. Paul says, I have had this kind of experience. Now you understand what I mean by qualification. Paul says, I had this experience. He said, but I don't even know if I was in the body or if I was out of the body. All I know is that I had this experience, and it is my experience. And Paul said, I kept it a secret but you have forced me to talk about something that I didn't want to talk about. You know why I didn't want to talk about it? What happens when we get something? We what? We boast about it. And Christians are known to boast about their spirituality. They get a little bit of religion, and everybody else is a sinner. Oh, yeah. We are good at boasting about our spirituality. That's why God, and we learn from Paul here, Paul said, I've been caught up into the third heaven. I witnessed things and I heard things that I cannot even tell you about, whether he didn't know how to express it in human terms or whether he was given a command that he was not supposed to say anything about what he saw in this third heaven. Do y'all believe in God? Do you believe that there's another place beside this old earth that you're living in? I hope you do. And I hope as a Christian, I hope that you believe that there's something greater beside this old world that you and I are living in. I get excited when I think about the Lord has prepared a place for me. I get excited about that, knowing that I'm going to be with Christ. When, Pastor, how do you know that you're going to be and other people don't know? Because of my faith in Christ, not my good works. I got a long way to go with that. It's what Jesus does. It's what Jesus has promised. But here's the thing about what Paul is saying in that first God's sufficient grace in spiritual encounter. It's, let me tell you something. Whenever we get an opportunity to talk about what God has done for us, whether it be an experience, whether it be a salvation, or whether it be your baptism, or whatever it is that God has, it has uh, touched you with, and we get a chance to talk about it, we ought to tell the world. You know why? The world is constantly asking us as Christians, who do you believe in and what do you believe in? Yes, folks, many of us don't have an answer. I'm not talking about unsaved people. I'm talking about Christian people. When the world comes to you between a rock and a hard place, they ask you, why do you believe in the thing that you believe in? Can you tell them? Have you had an experience? Now, I want to be very careful here because I don't want to paint the picture that every one of us have to have an experience like Paul. I don't want to paint that picture because that's not true. 
Matter of fact, Paul wouldn't be writing this in, his, in, the, in the Scriptures today if he had not been forced to do so, as he said, a brag about himself, as he said, because of his opponents. It was necessary for them to know the truth and to know the validation of his ministry. In other words, Paul is saying, this is no fluke. When I met Jesus on the road to Damascus, something happened to me, and it transformed my life. And ever since, I've been a prisoner for Jesus. Ever since that day that Christ touched my life, I have been a prisoner for Jesus. I suffered shipwreck. I went naked, thrown in prison, dungeon, no light, slime and cold, no food, shivering. That was a point that Paul said in, him, in one of the scriptures, he said, I, I thought I was going to die. I thought the death angel had come to take me. He said, but by, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, I was spared. I was brought back to life. But here's another thing about what Paul is saying. God's grace is sufficient in this spiritual encounter. He said, I don't live my life on that experience. He said, that was one experience. God don't just show up one time in your life. He shows up all the time. Paul is saying that I don't use this encounter to say that I'm better than anyone else. I don't use this encounter to say that you have to be like me. He said, I don't use this encounter to say that I have now encompassed all that God is and all that God will be. He said, I don't use that one experience. Instead, he says, I boast about my weakness. Who boasts about their weakness? What person tells me that you have heard boasting about how weak they are? You know, you know, no one does that. An organization I served in, everybody's strong, even when you're weak, even when you have family problems, even when you had medical uh, uh, problems. Everyone was strong, but that's the organization that we work for, and that's the organization that our men and women still work for. No one brags about being weak. It's not a good thing in our society to say that you're weak. People look at you funny. He's weak. And this is exactly what they said about Paul. Look at him. Little short thing. He's weak. He's not six foot. He's weak. We have to be very careful. That one encounter with God does not surpass all the greatness that God wants to do in our lives. Too many people settle for that. Well, I was baptized when I was 10 years old. Well, you still baptized because you haven't moved them far. I, I was saved when I was uh, 15 or whatever. Well, let me tell you something. That's great. But God is greater than that. And I hope that over in, your, in your faith journey, you have discovered God in more ways than just one way. Spiritual encounters. And there are some people don't believe in such thing. They don't believe in demons. They don't believe in Satan. They don't believe in anything that has to do with the supernatural. They don't. And there's Christians who don't believe. I grew up in an area where the supernatural was prevalent. You respected the supernatural. Especially when somebody want to put some roots on you. <laughs> you remember that? Y'all don't know anything about that, do you? Y'all know about somebody putting roots on you? Go down to the islands and get some stuff and bring it back to you. And you if your man is acting crazy, put something in his drink, and he goes more crazy. 
But let me tell you something. All of that is an indication, whether it's good or bad, it's an indication that there's something bigger and greater out there than you and me fleshly. That's all. They exist. Paul says in Ephesians, high powers, evil spirits, they exist. Look at our society today. Look at our young men and women who are dying of overdose, drugs. Look at it. Look at the young men and women who violently kill each other. But Paul's encounter with God was so special that he refused to talk about it because he did not want people to think that he was more than anyone else. Why? Because Paul was weak. He was a weak man. Not only do we find that, uh, that, that but Paul said because of this great experience, God gave him a thorn. And he tells you why. He, in Scripture, he tells you why that thorn was given to him. He says, I think in verse 7, to me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Paul said to keep himself from becoming conceited. What does that word mean? Thinking of yourself more than you ought to think. Thinking that you're all lit. He said, keep me from thinking that even in the religious term, even in the spiritual terms, God gave me a thorn. God gave it to him. God gave Paul a thorn in his flesh. There are some commentators who try to specify what this thorn is, but no one knows. Some of Paul's writings indicate that the thorn could have been an eye problem. I don't know. But it does not specifically say. Again, Paul tries to keep the limelight off of himself and put it back on God. Instead of worrying about the thorn, he said that God has given him a thorn to keep him humble. You know what happens to human beings when they're not humble? We mess up things. You put us in charge, and we mess up things. You give us an opportunity to serve, and we become a master, a slave master. You know what happens when, when we become conceited. We think that we are God's gift to the whole world. Even in the Christian realm, God has blessed us with gifts and talents, leadership skills, but we're not to abuse them. We're not to look down on other folks because they maybe lack those skills. Instead, we're to build each other up. We're to help the body of Christ. A friend called me the other day and was saying that uh, he was going through an experience. And in that experience, he was saying that uh, he was talking to God about this decision. He prayed about it. As he prayed, the Lord gave him an answer. Finally, he said, the Lord said, he says to the Lord, well, Lord, why did you pick me for this particular task? Why am I so special? Why am I the first one? That's exactly what his word was. You know what the Lord told him? You are not the first one. Did y'all hear that? God said, you think, I, you think you're the only one I've been talking to? You know what the Lord said to him? But you're the only one that was listening. <laughs> Did y'all get that? He said, I've been speaking. I've been talking. And I'm talking every day, but, you, but others are not listening. You just happen to hear my voice, and you responded to it. Are you listening for the voice of God today? 
What is he telling you? What is he trying to get through in your life that he's trying to get you to do or wanting you to commit to? What is God saying to you? Have you ever taken a moment to sit down to yourself and say, Lord, speak to me? Man. Paul says God's grace is sufficient even in the hard times and the thorns that are inflicted on us. He said those thorns come from Satan. And Job, what happened to Job? Read the book of Job. This poor boy suffered. Who inflicted the, 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 the pain on him? Satan. Does the, the, the Satan inflict hardship and disease on people today? Yes. He has that kind of power. God allowed Paul to be inflicted with this thorn for the rest of his life. I've heard of people, I've not experienced it myself, that's why sometimes I say I'm not qualified to talk about some things in the Scripture because I've not experienced a lot of stuff. People who have come down with shingles. I've heard of people having that, and I've heard from my sister before she passed, she talked about her bout with it and how painful it was. But eventually, she was healed. But here's a thorn in Paul's flesh for the rest of his life. For the rest of his life, he prayed. For the rest of his life, he asked God to take away this thorn. What happened when God don't answer our prayers? I talked about that a little bit last week. When God is silent, what happens? What happened to our faith? What happened to our faith journey when God seems to be silent? Do we keep going? Do we give in to our weaknesses? Or we learn like Paul. God spoke to Paul and said, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace. It is the thorns that God uses to mold us. You will never get what God has intended for, intended for you if life is always peachy cream. You'll never get it. Now, I'm not asking you, and I'm not myself volunteering to go through suffering, okay? (laughs) I'm not asking you to do that. All the thing I want you to know today is that whatever situation that you find yourself in, God's grace is available for you in that situation. That's what I'm telling you. That's it. The word sufficient. Means what? Enough. Not a whole lot, but just enough to get you through. When I was a kid going to school, elementary school, my mama used to make some biscuits. And she would have some fat back. Do y'all know what that is? (laughs) Say amen, church. (laughs) What about um, cane syrup? Oh, yeah, on a few of y'all, okay. Molasses, okay, I accept molasses. But it was just enough to get you through the morning, to get you on the school bus, (laughs) to get out of the house. God's grace is just enough to get you through the situation that you are going through. It won't be no more. It won't be no less. It'll be just enough. That's what sufficient means. This thorn that uh, Paul talks about was a thorn that that was a, a, he called it a thorn in my side. It prevented him from doing a lot of things. Some of you are going through some health issues right now. The things that you used to do, you're not able to do them anymore. 
places that you would like to go and, and the energy that you want exerted, you don't have that anymore. Sometimes God comes to us and he gives us a thorn in the flesh to slow us down. We don't know what's on the other side of that thorn, what could be worse. Paul experienced this thorn in the flesh so that God will keep him humbled. You know what else? You're not going to experience the power of God playing church. You're not going to do it. You're not going to experience God's power by trying to act like a Christian. No, it's something greater and deeper than that. You're not going to experience God's uh, um, uh, power by thinking yourself, even as a Christian, that you're better than your brothers and sisters who are going through some trials, marital problems, addictions. God allow us thorns to come into our lives for his purpose. God's grace is sufficient enough in the thorns that's in your side. It's not your wife and not your husband, okay? I've heard people say that. <laughs> I'm bailing everybody out. <laughs> it's not either one. The thorn that God inflicts is one for his purpose. Now, we occur a lot of thorns on our own that God had nothing to do with. We go out into the brow patch and put our hands on things that we shouldn't be putting our hands on, or going into places that we shouldn't be going to. We do that ourselves, not God. So don't blame everything on God. But you can't blame it on the devil. Our good old friend Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. I don't know if he realized what he was saying. I think he did, but I don't, understand, I don't know if he realized the implication of what he was saying. I mean, it was a comedy. But the devil has a lot to do with our responses, our attitude, and how we act. He's always, he was always with Jesus. The scripture says that when Jesus was tempted, the devil didn't go away and say, okay, you won the battle, see you later. The devil says, I'm going to catch you at your weakest moment when you least expect. That's the way the devil does. But how, but how do we become wise to the devil? What is the tool that we use to, to be aware of the devil and to fight off the devil? How, how, what are the tools that God has given us? Number one, his word. Scriptures, memorizing the scripture. What is another tool that he uses? The Holy Spirit that lives in us. What is another tool that God uses to ward off the devil in our lives? Y'all can be a preacher for a second. What was that? Who said prayer? All those that said prayer, raise your hand. Correct. Prayer and communion with God. You'll never know the devil's tricks until you spend time with God in prayer and meditation. And he, through the Holy Spirit, will reveal to you, this is a setup. <laughs> this is a trick. Now, you know that if you use that attitude, you know exactly what you're going to get. You know if you keep hounding him about the garbage, you know good and well what you're going to get. That's what the devil does. The devil come in, the Holy Spirit try to remind you. Now, if you're going to do that, this is the way you do it. And we fight the Spirit of God, don't we? <laughs> we fight the Spirit of God. Here's another thing Paul talks about. Weakness. What does he say about our weakness? He said that our uh, Three times I plead with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said, no. But he said, I'm going to give you my grace. My grace is sufficient for you. 
and my power is made perfect in weakness. It's not your ability. It's not your strength. It's not your, not your, 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 your talents that God is looking for. When God is looking for men and women to serve him, he's looking for people who are weak. In what sense are they weak? They're weak in the sense that they constantly depend upon God. They constantly realize their limitations. They constantly believe that the job or the task that God has given them is out of their ability, out of their lane. They constantly believe that God can do it. When I took this church, the devil said, you can't do that. The devil said, you, you, can't, you can't, Pastor. I said, Lord, I'm not qualified to be the pastor of this church. Look at me. Look at my past. The more I argue with God, the more he says, you're the man. You know why? Because I turned it over to him. I've been with y'all for how many years now? How many? Four or five? Five years. I'm here because of God put me here. I'm here, I'm here not because of somebody else's credentials, not somebody else's recommendation. Not because I lobbied with the, 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 the Southern Baptist Convention. No. When God has a place for you, you don't need all that. All you need to say, Lord, here I am. I'm willing to serve you the best I know how. And when I submitted my life to Christ, when I submitted yes to God, he said, here's the place. I said, but Lord, what about this? What about that? Guess what he said? Just follow me. Just do it one day at a time. I'm going to tell you something. This has been a joyous ride. Did y'all hear me, church? You have been a joyous congregation. You have been the best that I could ever imagine or dream or hope for. But I had to place it all in the hands of God. I had to realize that in myself, I could not do it, and I can't do it. And I'm still that way today, depending upon God. Jesus Christ. When he went to the cross for our sins, he was weak. The Apostle Paul talks about weakness. And in and, and 1 Corinthians, God says those that he chose are weak compared to the world standard. So if you're feeling out of sync today, if you're feeling that you can't do it, if you're, if you're waiting for something to happen, it's not going to do it. It's not going to happen. There won't be no flashing lights in the sky like they will be tonight. There won't be any angels descending on the field singing hallelujah. You won't get that. But what you will get, you will get God's approval. What you will get, you'll get a sense of his presence. What you will get, you'll get the courage to move forth with nothing in your hands but Jesus. Did y'all hear me? Too many people are waiting for a certain uh, right time. Oh, I got to wait until this get right. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You're missing it. Don't, don't wait for that because it's not going to happen. You'll be waiting for 30 years. Remember that commercial, that, uh, the progressive uh, one that they got with the little kids? Remember that one? Y'all see it? Progressive. Well, I like that one. Uh, progressive, uh, you have what you need. No, what is that? Mutual. I'm sorry. I, I gave y'all the wrong kudos. Okay. But anyway, these kids are jumping and singing a song, and they keep counting. Guess what? Huh? They're old. <laughs> Still singing the song that they started out when they was kids. You got to watch that commercial. And some of us are like that. We still think that things are going to change once we see it and when we recognize it. You're not going to recognize it. Jesus said the kingdom of God is in you. You're not going to see it in no big display. What you're going to see it in your heart. That's exactly where you're going to see it. But it's your weakness. Get 
Gideon. He had 32,000 men to fight. The Lord said, oh, I don't need that many. He dwindled it down to another whatever number it was. How many did he end up with? 300 to fight a whole army. You know why God said he gave him, wanted him to use that little man? So that the people themselves, once they won the war, they would not say to themselves, look what I did. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I have a jealous God. God don't want you to take credit for something that you have not, uh, that you don't have, that you didn't create. He don't want you to take credit for that. He wants, that's why it's so important that we give thanks to God. Because everything comes from God. And I can imagine, I can believe that God is just smiling when human creatures take a moment and say, thank you. Gideon learned it was by God's grace. The fourth point I want to highlight for quite a minute, few minutes is God's sufficient grace is the power of Christ who lives in you. I want you to focus on that moment. Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian, he lives in you. He promised his disciples in John chapter 14 and 16 that I'm going to give you my paraclete and they will be in you. The spirit of the living Christ lives in you. Paul says my, my grace is sufficient and it's because of the power of Christ who is in me that gives me the power to overcome anything. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ. All things through Christ that strengthen me. I tried that one time on a math test. Don't believe that. <laughs> Don't take it out of context, okay? <laughs> I flunked that mass test. <laughs> I said, Lord, I do the best I can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthen me. <laughs> but guess what? You didn't pass that test, buddy. I went back to the Lord and said, I'm not talking about math. <laughs> I'm talking about service. I'm speaking about enabling you to do the thing that the kingdom of God needs to be done. He said, am I able to do that through you? Don't take it out of context. Bible says you can do all things through Christ now, but if you didn't study, you better study. Because Jesus ain't going to come to you and say, here's the answer. He ain't doing it that way. He's going to tell you to discipline yourself and get down in them books. But the power of Christ who lives in us, it is the power of Christ that, it, that makes our Christian life, our Christian faith, it's exciting. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I come to give you life, and I come to give you more abundantly. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, he says, it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. All you got to do is open up and say, channel, channel your love and your grace through me. Well, Pastor, if I do that, will I sin again? Yeah, you're going to sin again. As long as you're in this old flesh, you're going to sin again. You're going to say things again. You're going to drive down Hope Mills Road again. You're going to go on Skyboy again. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. These are some challenging streets. <laughs> They'll make the best Christian say things or not say things or think things. How is that? My grace is sufficient. So whatever you're going through today, God's grace is available. Our brother Sam is in the hospital along with Cheryl and others. I want to say to you this morning, God's grace is sufficient. It may not come the way that you want to, but it's coming through the nurses, the doctors, and the people that's uh, taking care of you. God's grace is sufficient. Let me close by simply saying this. I seriously challenge you this morning that if you want more of God's activity in your life, you will have to surrender that life. If you want to see and experience the power of the living God in your life, you will not get it by watching other Christians. You will not get it by watching older saints. You will not get it by borrowing religion from church to church. You will get it only with your personal relationship with Christ. 
You can't borrow this. You can't ask another Christian to loan you this spirituality. You must surrender your life to Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24, the one who calls you is faithful. When you and I are not faithful, God is faithful. When, I, when you and I don't feel like being Christian, God is faithful. We can call on him at any time. He said, uh, the one who calls you is faithful and not you will do it. He will do it. God is always looking for the one person who will say, yes, Lord. I trust you, believe you won't to do something special in my life. I believe that you have an abundant life for me. I believe that my life could be exciting, and even at the moment when it's not exciting. I believe that God has a plan for me. I don't believe that I should live on this earth and just die and somebody bury me and never come to my grave again. I don't believe that you put me here for that reason. I believe that you put me on this earth so that I can enjoy life, enjoy God, and serve his people, and serve the living God, and experience his power. Power of healing. Do you know that you have the power to heal others through God's working through you? I've allowed myself, and I don't want to bring attention to myself, but I'm just telling you from my experience as a Christian, I've seen people being healed through prayer. I've laid hands on people through prayer. Some I didn't believe that it would work. Be honest with you. Paul says, it is in my weakness, it is in insults, it is in hardship, it is in those down days that I experience the power of the living God. And because of that, he said, I welcome these things. Now, he's not volunteering and saying, oh, y'all, come on, get me. What he says that when they come, he said, I found strength. And when they come, when the old insults, Come. When the hardship comes, he said, I found God to be faithful in every situation. My friend, the 21st century believers in Christ, God is faithful. God is faithful. You give him a chance. You may not do it. You may do it, Lord willing, a week from now, maybe a year. But whatever, whenever he says it's time, say, here I am, Lord. Here I am. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, through your Holy Spirit, through your Son, Jesus Christ, we come. Lord, we confess our sins. We confess that we are fearful, we are doubtful, we are, we are scared. Lord, we can do nothing on our own. All of our hope and all of our dreams and everything that we have comes from you. Lord, you deserve our attention. You deserve our worship and praise. The Lord is hard here on this earth. I have to go back to my job. I have to be around people that, 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 that don't like me or I don't like them. I have to deal with all these things. But by your grace, you'll help me. You'll change my inner heart so that the power of Christ may rest on me, not me. I can do nothing on my own. Paul says, I boast in my weakness. I boast in the fact that it's not me. I boast in the fact that it is God's power that's working inside me, transforming me. It is God who gets the glory, not me, not my shortcoming, not my temper, not my attitude, but rather God works his power in us to do the mission, to do the thing that he calls us to do for his honor and his own glory so that all we can say is, Lord, be glory to God. We pray this prayer, and we pray for anyone today who has never accepted Christ into their heart, who are struggling with what they, God wants them to do, who are, who are putting it on hold, who is waiting for a certain sign. I pray that in Jesus' name, they submit that and they commit that to you today. Here I am, Lord. I'm ready for the battle. Equip me. Build me up. Strengthen me. And help me to serve you to the best I know how. Father, we pray and thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the anointing. Thank you, O oh God, 
We give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. He'll lose the faith for Mount. He'll lose the marching hall. these gifts for your kingdom and for your service. We thank you for those that are able to give, those that are, aren't able to give. We thank you, Lord, for their, their presence and their dedication and service to you. Bless now these, these gifts for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you all stand, please, to receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit be with you.
May you go in your weakness and find strength in service that God will strengthen you for his kingdom to do what he's calling you to do. Have a blessed day. Have a blessed 4th of July. Enjoy your families and friends and celebrate our country. Go in peace and the God of peace will be with you. Have a great day. with